All right, uh, I'm super excited to be here to talk to you all about text analysis and visualization. Uh, it's like five degrees warmer on stage, so I'm extra happy to be, to be here. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Irene Ross, and I'm the Director of Data Visualization at Boku, um, and I'm a programmer. I've been a programmer for a long time. Um, I like to show this slide and then say that it's my street cred, because I was coding on the street. Anyways, dad jokes. I hope you like them. I have some more. Um, anyways, uh, I have an amazing team of folks uh, at Boku, where we uh, are a service consulting company. We work with amazing organizations like Jeff Pierce's team, which was uh, so fun to work with. Um, and we basically work in data visualization projects on the open web across the full pipeline of data viz work. Um, and I'm super excited about all the kinds of projects we've been working on, so definitely check us out, especially if you need some help. Um, and I also run OpenVizConf in Boston, uh, which is a two-day conference about uh, data visualization on the open web, and our CFP is open right now until November 20th. I would be remiss if I didn't try to pimp that up. So please go submit your talks. Uh, CFP is super short, and it's going to be our fifth year, so it's going to be a big deal. Um, Anyway, so I want to talk to you about, about text and why text is really important. And I used to have to justify this um, a lot more. And then this, like, this election happened, and I really don't have to justify it all that much anymore because everyone's asking what happened with the polls and data science, what is even, and predictions, how do I, I don't know. Um, and I always say, hey, you know what we had was the stuff people said. We had like a ton of that. So let's think about next, next time around, maybe we won't have to, but at the same time, maybe we also could do a better job of visualizing and analyzing and talking about the actual words that our candidates were using and so on and so forth. So thanks, Election, for making the case for me uh, for text visualization. Um, and so text is data too. Uh, and when I talk about text, I really am talking about kind of two different breakdowns. One is really looking at a single document, a news article, a book, just a single body of text uh, versus looking at a collection uh, of many documents, uh, a corpus, if you will. Uh, and I want to focus a lot on a single document because that's kind of really the building blocks, and I'll just touch on a few things you can do with collections. Uh, but hopefully this will arm you a little going off and exploring on your own. Um, and so we'll start off with a single document um, and, and kind of look at some basic measurements that you can get from it and what you need to do to clean up data. So data janitoring, you still have to do it. You can't get rid of it no matter what your, uh, your data structure is. Um, same with text. Um, and then look at some structure and word relationships. So um, this is an example of a text that I chose for a lot of my examples. Alice in Wonderland is a, uh, it's a really fun book. Hopefully you've read it from Project Gutenberg. It's free, so no copyright infringement there. Um, and this is just the first three paragraphs. Obviously, if you're just reading the book, you probably just want to read it. Um, but uh, if you have a lot of content and you're just trying to get a quick summarization of it or understand what's really significant in it, you know, maybe you don't have time to sit and read the whole thing. Um, and so uh, there's a few different basic units of, of uh, uh, measurement that you can collect, and the, the most basic one really is just counts, counts of words. Um, and so if I just do the, those three paragraphs and I look at the top words um, that are on that side, um, I can see there are some words that appear very uh, frequently, like the word the and the word it and to and of, which is not particularly exciting. Um, those words can be significant, and if you're interested in the secret life of pronouns, uh, there's a great book by James Pennebaker that I highly suggest reading. But in this particular case, it's not very telling about what this text is about. Um, you may have also seen these word clouds. This is a, a, a Wordle. Uh, it was a, a huge internet thing of several years ago, and still people make them. Um, and again, it just sizes the words by frequency. I think it removes some stop words and things like that. But I would still argue that while this is visually pleasing, it's not very telling. I mean, I know this is about Alice. The book is called Alice in Wonderland. So um, again, you may not really get very far, and the interpretation of these is pretty subjective, especially depending on the, the font and colors and things that you choose. Um, but we started seeing some better uses of counts, so this was from this year's uh, Democratic debate, just looking at counts of uh, the words the candidates said, just a small glimpse into maybe who was dominating debates and things of that nature. Um, and so I want to just start showing you little code snippets of how you can accomplish some of this uh, using Python, uh, Python's NLTK package. Um, and these will be really short and hopefully large enough for you all to see, um, but um, and don't worry about capturing it, obviously I'll put my slides up online afterwards. Um, so, uh, well, in order to get counts, the first basic thing we may want to do, um, we can import an LTK and we can import the counter object from, the, from collections. Um, and NLTK has uh, a tokenization 
several tokenization functions. The first uh, in relevant to us is word underscore tokenize, and it'll just take your text and it'll break it up into just a list of individual words. Um, and that's pretty handy. There's also a sentence tokenizer if you want to break things up by sentences. Um, and uh, after that, we can just put them into this counter object. And the counter object basically just goes through, adds up all the words, um, and kind of creates a dictionary of them uh, in that way. And then I just sort them based on reverse count. Um, and I get this list. And you know, again, it's not particularly interesting. I know that there are uh, 2,418 commas, but that's not very telling, again, about this text. Um, and so there's quite a bit of cleanup that we probably need to do before we go and actually try to do um, any kind of aggregation on this data. And so I'm going to take a slight diversion uh, and look at some cleaning, cleanup routines that are always useful when you're working with text, um, although not always, you don't always want to do all of them, and it kind of really depends on the, pro the part of the process you're in. So the first one is to remove punctuation. Python has a, a, a a, uh, the, the string class will let you import a, just a, a list of punctuation marks. Uh, you can see in the comma what they are, pretty standard. Um, and you can just iterate over your tokens and remove the token if it's within that list of punctuation. So you can see, uh, I always, I'll try to have kind of two examples of before and after. Um, and you can see before I had a period in there and that got removed. Um, so that's great, it's pretty simple. Um, the next one is really normalizing the case of the words you're working with. Because fundamentally, if you have a sentence, that the first letter is going to be capitalized in that word, like beginning, and then somewhere later in the book, you have beginning in the middle of a sentence. Those are the same word, and you want to be, make sure you capture that. So uh, you pick a case, generally lowercase, uh, and just downcase all of your tokens. So you can see chapter, who was, uh, was capitalized before, is now all lowercase, and so on and so forth. Um, the next one that uh, is also can be important is, again, remove stop words. Stop words are generally the kind of words you would not put in a Google search. They generally are not going to yield anything meaningful for you, uh, and most of the time they're not telling about the actual context or content of what you're working with. Um, and there's lots of lists of stop words. Um, generally, they're you know, per language, so nltk.corpus has a list of stop words that we can get uh, for English and other languages, and I can do the same exact remove token routine that I was using with my punctuation. So you can see that it removed I um, and uh, uh, lots of other words as well. So again, that's pretty handy as long as you uh, don't mind losing the semantic meaning of the way words are tied together. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, oops. Uh, there's also uh, the tokenization routines will sometimes leave fragments behind. So things like apostrophe S or N apostrophe T, which are not words. Um, and so you can just write a really, really simple way to just iterate through your text and remove those tokens if that's what they are. Uh, I happen to be just removing apostrophes. I, I always forget to do this because unless I actually see this in like my you know first 20 words that I look at in my uh, sample text, I may just not do it and then they'll show up later down the road. But um, just a little thing I learned to eventually uh, throw in there. And then the last one is, uh, is stemming. So stemming will convert words to their base form. So for example, if I look at the three words house, housing, and housed, the base form of them is house with no E. I don't know how to pronounce that, but H-O-U-S. Um, and stemming, again, is really handy if you want to remove conjugation and pluralization and really aggregate on that kind of more base levels. They don't always make a ton of sense, uh, like N-O-T-H. I assume that, uh, you know, it happens to be the base form of nothing. Um, but, uh, you know, they will sometimes lose some of their semantic meaning. And so um, it becomes a little bit harder if you are then going to take this and translate it into some kind of a user display. You may want to make sure that you have a reference back to what the original terms were somehow because a rabbit hole, H-O-L, um, you know, people can kind of get what that means, but it obviously isn't as user friendly. So um, having done all of these things, you can see my counts are substantially improved. Um, Alice has moved up. Um, said, Alice said is a, a term that appears a lot, is a combo that appears a lot. Um, so said is actually really frequent. The king and the queen are in there. Uh, time appears, which is kind of interesting. Think, oh, well, how does time factor into the story, so on and so forth, which certainly is just doing a lot better than what we had before. So those are some kind of really basic things, text cleanup. Um, and so now we can go back to thinking again about some of the things that we can do with text. Um, and let's think a little bit, like one level up, about the structure of the text we're actually working with. Um, specifically about part of speech tagging. So if I take the first couple paragraphs 
of this text, and I put it through uh, a, a speech tagger, part of a speech tagger. Um, I'm gonna get something like this, obviously in different, different forms, but what it does is it assigns uh, a job to every word, right? So every word in our language, as, as we use it, will have some kind of a task. It's either a verb, or it's a noun, or it's an adjective, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, its position and context will let us kind of infer that. And so uh, there are lots of part of speech taggers that basically use rules for a specific language um, to be able to take in text and output these kinds of tagged, uh, this kind of tagged information. Uh, and there's quite a lot of different types of tags. I don't even know what some of these mean, um, but uh, they certainly exist. Um, and it really lets you kind of break down um, the, the, the parts of the text that you're really looking for. Um, and for example, there was a project that we had done a few years ago um, using this great community called TV Tropes, where uh, it was a wiki-based um, website where a lot of uh, people who loved film and television would go and document uh, tropes as they saw them, and they would write these really beautiful descriptions of what the trope is and, and cite references to what, what kind of media it appears in. Um, and we were really intrigued by this community, especially because it also then had lists of always male and always female tropes. And we thought, oh man, now we have uh, kind of these language bases for the way characters are portrayed in our media as being male or female, All right? Pretty cool. Uh, and so what we did is we extracted all of the adjectives using um, part of speech tagging and worked with that as our subset uh, of data. And we built stereotropes. You can see it at stereotropes.boku.com. Uh, it's kind of a click hole, so don't look at it now. Um, but uh, basically, you can go and review any of these tropes. Uh, these are just some of the top ones, like Action Girl or Damsel in Distress. Um, and we, uh, using another technique called log likelihood, we then um, would give you all of the adjectives that appear in that particular description and tell you how unique they are to that specific description versus other ones. So for example, good or bad, those are terms that appear in most of them. Whereas for this particular one, valuable and play along uh, or immediate were, were fairly unique relative to everything else. Um, and the click hole comes in when it you know, starts telling you other ones that it appears in, and you're like, how is this even a trope? I don't even know. And then it's been half an hour. Anyways, um, so this was really fun, and it also let us, again, look at aggregate in some of the, this terminology um, and you know, certainly reveal some patterns that I hope we, we move past in our media uh, you know, about describing more feminine characters as young and cute and, uh, or describing male characters for some reason as white. Um, but we really could discern that from the text. And it was a fascinating way for us to uh, see what, uh, the, the way this community w was uh, perceiving the media. And we were really nervous that they were going to be mad at us, but they were actually really thrilled that we were able to kind of bring this higher level view to what they were doing. Um, so uh, again, in uh, Python, it's really just a one-liner, it's pretty cool, NLTK dot pass underscore tag, and you pass it the tokens that, you, um, that you've separated, and it'll just give you a, a list of tuples with those roles. Um, now, it's really important that you actually pause tag your raw tokens. Do not remove punctuation or capitalization or stem, all of that, because that's going to remove some of the context that is really necessary for the pause tagger to work well. Um, this is something I forget sometimes, and I actually uh, ran it at first, and it tagged Alice as an adjective, and I was like, what is happening here? So um, something to keep in mind. Um, anyways, so pause tagging, pretty cool. One of my favorite techniques um, to look at different chunks of, uh, of content. Um, but obviously words appear together, and so they have some kind of relationship to each other that we may not want to get rid of. Um, and so we're gonna look at uh, a few different techniques, concordance, engrams, and co-occurrence. Engrams, also known as co-location, but I decided that was three too many words that started with co um, in this slide. <laughs> Um, so concordance really lets you look at a keyword in context. That was also another name that you'll see for it sometimes. Um, and NLTK has uh, this other class called text that will take your tokens and create a, a searchable object that is a little bit more easy to manipulate. Um, and so here, for example, um, what I can do is I can give it a, a keyword and it'll just show me some terms on each side of that keyword. Uh, and you can generally like, usually control that. Um, so here I can see where Alice appears and all of the context in which uh, that term appears. Um, and there's kind of a, a, a one common view that's called the concordance plot will actually just show you where the terms appear within a body of text. So here every rectangle is represented as a text and the vertical lines represent where that word appears. So you can uh, see, for example, Alice appears all throughout the book, whereas the caterpillar you know, only appears in those uh, few specific sections. The king comes in towards the end. So you know, especially in characters, you can really kind of almost start feeling, okay, here's maybe a bit of a narrative plot of where they're appearing. And again, we saw that used uh, in the selection 
section, also by the Washington Post, uh, looking at when different candidates spoke during the Democratic debate. Um, and again, this gives you a little bit of a sense of uh, back and forth. It gives you a sense of who got more stage time, things of that nature. Um, and the concordance plot very easily led us to um, this really great visualization that used to be a part of many eyes that I worked on years ago, may it rest in peace. Um, and it's been re-implemented by Jason Davies, uh, now in JavaScript, it used to be a Java applet. Um, and it does basically the same thing that a concordance does, except it collapses the following terms as they appear together. So here, um, you know, I, starting with the word O, that's my root, um, you know, I can see that many sentences start with O oh dear, or O oh comma, or O oh, exclamation mark. Um, and I can kind of see that tree. It's surprisingly fun. Well, it's not that surprisingly fun. It's really fun um, to just kind of pick a text and start looking through it um, and really seeing some of those relationships. Um, uh, and the next form is, is, uh, is n-grams. So um, obviously, we've been looking at a single word, but sometimes looking at two or three or four words can be more informative, because if they appear together a lot, maybe they're more significant. Um, and so actually, Google has an amazing data set of bigrams, basically all of the bigrams that uh, appear on the internet that they crawl. Um, and it's a huge data set. Uh, and it really can give us quite an insight into the way language is used. And so this was an example uh, of a set of visualizations created by Chris Harrison um, that I thought was kind of fun to start looking at. Um, so the each word, smart or dumb, are kind of you know opposites of each other, and they're also the first word of a pairing. So smart people or uh, dumb questions, dumb idea, smart choice, so on and so forth. And the more commonly the second word appears with one or the other, the closer it's going to be to that versus words in the middle that are fairly common to both. So again, kind of a really quick way to just uh, see, okay, are there particularly strong associations with one or the other. Um, he's also then recreated these in this uh, different sort of swoopy thing. Um, so you can see past year versus future generations, for example, those are terms most likely associated with those uh, past or future terms. Um, and uh, working with biograms, again, in LTK, super easy. Um, you can, uh, um, from nltk.colocations, you can import biogram collection, uh, collocation finder. Um, and you can give it your filter tokens, whatever the case may be. Um, it is good to remove punctuation here because, you know, a word and a period are not that significant. Um, and then uh, there are different ways by which to actually determine whether a bigram is significant or not. So you can use raw uh, just raw frequencies, right, terms appearing together overall. Uh, but you're, again, going to get a lot of those filler terms, said the, of the, said Alice, so on and so forth. So uh, instead of using raw frequency, um, I always tend to use um, the likelihood ratio, just uh, how much more unique this particular combination is. Uh, and so here you can start seeing much more interesting terms, mock turtle, said Alice, March Hare, uh, the king, the queen, the griffin, so on and so forth. So uh, bigrams, really super fun, really interesting to look at. Um, uh, especially boilerplate text, finding boilerplate text in legislation or uh, any other kind of templated forms. Um, uh, a long time ago, we uh, were looking for uh, um, that kind of language that uh, uh, lobbyists will try to get into legislation and just trying to find engram overlaps between documents. Um, and you could really see that happening a fair bit. Um, anyways. Thank you. Uh, and uh, the next version is co-occurrence. Uh, so again, we talked about words being adjacent to each other, but words can also be separated in some kind of a pattern that may appear frequently. So um, uh, PhraseNet was a project that Frank Van Ham did. It was also a part of many, uh, many eyes a long time ago. Um, and you could specify a pattern, just x, you know, of y, x, and y, whatever the case may be. Um, and this is actually a visualization of the Old Testament, and the pattern is x begat y, and you can pretty much see the entire lineage of the Bible. Uh, and that cycle there is pretty funny because there are two people named the same thing. Obviously, not an actual um, <laughs> lineage situation. But um, it was pretty cool because you just reveal that in this really small, quick pattern. Um, and this was uh, another comparison of the Old Testament to the New Testament, looking at X of Y. And you can definitely see the differences in languages and pretty much tell which is which. You know, king of Israel, uh, children of Israel versus kingdom, son, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, and again, super, I was really surprised about how easy it is to do in Python. I was like, kind of excited. I spent a while doing this instead of my slides, um, where you can just use that find all and specify your pattern. So uh, this less than, greater than HTML tag uh, format is how you specify a token. Um, and in this case, I'm saying just give me a token of, and then another token. And so tired of sitting and of having, pleasure of making, trouble of getting, so on and so forth. And so now you just have this, and you can you know, go forth and create your, your um, beautiful visualizations. 
Um, so yeah, so those are a few things you can do within a text. Um, super exciting, lots of ideas uh, of ways to break, break different text up. But a lot of times we have collections of documents that we're working with. So perhaps emails um, or uh, news articles of a particular publication or so on and so forth. Uh, and most of the time we're, we're trying to either figure out what the corpus overall is talking about. Are there particular patterns? Are there groupings of these documents? Um, and how do they compare to each other? Um, and so uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, finding significance of words within documents using a technique called TF-IDF. It's, it's a, a pretty basic building block. Um, uh, TF-IDF stands for term frequency, inverse document frequency. Um, and the reason it's important is because um, it's hard to tell what language is significant otherwise when you look at a specific document. So for example, the occurrence of the word cat in an article in the New York Times, that's going to be probably significant. I bet that article has something to do with cats. Um, and, but the occurrence of the word cat in Cat Weekly magazine is probably not going to be that significant because I bet the word cat is in every article, so there's probably going to be something much more specific about maybe the food or some kind of a toy, or I don't know, I don't subscribe to Cat Weekly magazine. But um, it's most likely not going to be as significant. And so TFIDF really lets us suss that out, how unique is a term in a document uh, as related to all other documents uh, in that corpus. So term frequency is just the number of times that a term appears in a document over the total number of terms. So if I have one document with 100 words, three of them is cat, my TF score is uh, three divided by 100. Now the inverse document frequency um, is actually the log of the total number of documents over the total number of documents with the term in it. Um, and the reason that works really well um, is if I look at some of these examples. So if I have 10,000 documents, and in all 10,000 of them, the word cat appears, then cat is insignificant. That score is going to be zero. Whereas if I have 10,000 documents and one of them has the word cat, that's much more significant. That's got a much higher score. Uh, and you know, anywhere in between, that score is going to vary. So again, that helps us uh, extract terms specific to documents that may describe them really well, which is very handy. Um, and this was used a long time ago, but my, uh, uh, in a really cool project by my former collaborator, Fernando Vegas. Um, this project is 10 years old, which is really cool, um, called Themail, and it was looking uh, for unique words in email. So every column is uh, a bag of words uh, from emails of that particular month. Um, and words that are larger are ones that have a higher TF-IDF score. So this person, for example, the first four months was traveling in, um, in Asia, and so they got to, you know, started talking about their travel, which was different than their everyday conversations about Excel or whatever the case may be. You can see that uh, declining down. Um, and then the same thing, uh, and eventually they had a baby, and so you could see uh, words like family and baby really elevating. And over time, as those words become more common, this, this particular measure is actually quite good for changes um, happening over time. Um, so I want to touch a little bit on grouping and clustering. Um, the way clustering works is uh, you, can, uh, you, you have a collection of documents that may be labeled in some form. So news articles are a great example of that. The gray boxes are articles, um, and they'll generally all have a title of some sort, sport, entertainment, so on and so forth. That lets me train a classifier to basically be able to identify a new article coming in as being of a particular class. So that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, we used this to some success uh, in a project called Mini Bills, where we tried to make congressional legislation more fun to read. Um, it was very naive. Um, but, but what it did let us do is take legislation, and uh, all bills have a particular category they fall into, like finance and so on and so forth. And uh, what we could do is then take every chunk of a bill and try to determine what it was about. And this was an example where we found uh, this particular provision in a finance bill about uh, credit card consumer protection that had to do with letting people bring semi-automatic uh, weapons into national parks. Arguably not about credit cards, although depending how mad you are. Um, anyways, that was clearly an example of the sort of thing that happens uh, in politics to try and get some votes. Somebody sneaks in something into a bill. Um, and we were really trying to find a way to, to detect that um, using this technique. Um, and so one, uh, another aspect of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of working with collections of documents is you may want to be able to compare them in various ways uh, on a kind of a very basic level if you're really just comparing two things. This was from the national conventions of the previous election and just the terms that were being used by both uh, candidates. Uh, you can see who used what more. But a lot of times you have a lot more documents that you're working with. Um, and you may have much more terms. So for this, uh, for example, if I have documents here, what I can do is I can just add up all of the terms that I have individually and add the count. So five times I have the word cat, house, dog, monkey, and so on and so forth. And then I can build one giant vocabulary 
for every single document that I have and translate those into a vector for every single one of those original documents. So that's, you know, five cats, house, dog, monkey, and then I don't have any other terms, so I have lots of zeros. And then I can use these vectors to now work in, you know, a, a much sm smaller dimensional space. So for example, cosine similarity uh, will let us build vectors that will tell us how closely related documents are. The smaller the angle, the closer they are. The larger the angle, the more opposing they are. Um, and this is uh, one of the techniques that can be used for clustering. And I just wanted to show k-means clustering is a, a, a fun way to be able to take documents and break them up into a specific number of clusters based on similarity like this and other measures. Uh, but this is looking at 18 books from the Project Gutenberg, and you can see the Bible all the way by itself in a cluster, pretty separate from other books by, um, uh, uh, that, like Moby Dick, that obviously use a very different uh, kind of language. So uh, clustering will then let us really separate and look at a corpus at that higher level. So I want to talk a little bit about a few tools that may be of use to you. Uh, TextKit is actually a, a, a Python command line tool that we wrote. Um, Jim Vallandingham uh, uh, wrote with um, uh, the help of many others. Um, and you can find it at learntextviz.github.io slash textkit and just watch that URL for other fun things that may happen. But it lets you do a lot of that chunking and tokenization and bigram finding just on the command line. Um, it's open source. We would love for you to contribute, obviously, uh, and extend it. Um, this is also just a great collection of resources. Uh, I, I pulled a lot of them from a talk by Lynn Cherney, who's uh, one of the people I always watch out for cool things with text. Um, lots of tools that you can use without any knowledge of programming. Um, and there's also some coll additional collection of tools in there as well. Um, and there's lots of things I didn't cover that are really exciting in text. Things like topic modeling, being able to just discern um, what are the uh, um, what are different bags of words that together may form a topic. Um, uh, sentiment analysis, obviously a really interesting area, has lots of challenges in it, but also um, some amount of progress. Um, entity extraction, finding actual people and places and uh, organizations and things in text. word to vec and other neural networks. Um, which let you do some really fun math with words. Um, and obviously search on any kind of historic trends, but hopefully you've all seen Google Trends. It's just so much fun to play with. Um, and uh, yeah, well, with that, I will hopefully arm you with uh, some really small and quick things that you can do with text. Uh, and please go visualize some words. And thank you. I think I have time for maybe one question. One minute on the clock. No? Cool. Oh, yeah. Um, open-ended survey responses, yeah, uh, we actually do. We get surveys for OpenVisConf, and so I aggregate those. Um, and I'll definitely look for certain keywords. Um, I will look at adjectives as just a quick way to see what the overall feel was. Um, I also look at actually punctuation, how many exclamation marks I might be getting, things like that. But it's kind of a very exploratory sort of almost like I'm having a conversation with my data. I'm like, oh, I wonder how many of that is in there. So it generally doesn't translate to as much. But um, one thing that we have done every year for OpenViz is we've done uh, visualizations of our videos. And we uh, started getting the full transcripts. We actually have a transcriber on stage um, who's a hoot and holler. And uh, we have that text as a consequence. And so we've been visualizing that and trying to tie that back to the videos, looking for themes like, and things like that. And so I'd say that's closer to that. Um, so I'd definitely check those out. Cool. All right. Thank you, everyone.